Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's Reimagine Nova Scotia panel. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, before we get started, I just want to say that we wish to recognize that Dalhousie University sits on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, and we are all treaty people. So tonight, um, our theme is going to be Cultivate and Consume, and we're really excited about this panel. This is a really interesting theme to explore in Nova Scotia, and so we're really interested to get to that. But before we get into the, the theme for the, for the night, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Reimagine project. So uh, I should also tell you, my name is Lori Turnbull, and I am the director of the School of Public Administration here at Dalhousie University, and I'm going to moderate the panel tonight. So a few months ago, what seems like long ago now, but uh, months ago, we started having a conversation about how Dalhousie can contribute to the rebuilding effort in Nova Scotia once we start to get past the acute public health crisis that is COVID-19. And so obviously there's a lot of facets to the rebuilding, that there are economic, uh, public health, there are social community, um, you know, lots of different things to think about when we think about what Nova Scotia could look like when we get past COVID-19. And I think the way we were thinking about it is not so much strictly in terms of economic terms, but also how can we re rebuild in a much broader and deeper way? So obviously economic rebuilding is a big part of that and jurisdictions around the world are looking at how they can rebuild the economy after COVID. But we're looking you know, not only at that, but also at public health issues, uh, safety and security. We're looking at community rebuilding. We're looking at, um, you know, and as obviously tonight, we're going to be talking about things like food security and supply chain and, and what it means to cultivate and consume together. Um, we're very proud of this project. Uh, this originated in the Faculty of Management, but has the support of Dalhousie University. And we're very fortunate to have engaged colleagues in other faculties. And basically, when we decided we wanted to put this project together, we wanted to kind of organize it around themes so that there was some, you know, it would kind of have some structure and make some sense and we'd be able to get some, some, some thoughts out there in an organized way. And so we thought about different aspects of rebuilding and then we built um, five kind of clusters or theme, or, sorry, clusters or teams around five themes. And so um, each cluster has not only academics and researchers, but also practitioners, community members, members of, of government and business communities. So the idea was to get these people around the table together, really smart people who know about these things, but maybe who've never actually interacted and talked about these things together before. And in that new cluster environment, we're able to create something innovative and special and something that we haven't seen before. And so that's how each of the five groups worked. And tonight we're going to look at um, the findings and talk a little bit about this, the theme of cultivating and consuming. I would like to say that, I mean, obviously, jurisdictions around the world are struggling to deal with the effects of the pandemic. And now we're, we're you know, in many jurisdictions in, in the country, not so much Nova Scotia, but in the other places in the country and around the world, we are in the midst of a second wave. Um, in some in some cases, this is, you know, frightening escalation of the numbers of COVID. And so not only is this um, a public health crisis, obviously, but in Nova Scotia, we've also had to deal with um, the largest mass shooting in Canadian history at the same time, which has, I think, like lent, lent, led to a kind of a compound trauma that we're all dealing with. And that's also woven into the purpose behind this project. And I think at the same time as everybody else, we're dealing with the legacies of racism and colonialism and how we can move past, you know, and build on those things and understand those things and acknowledge those things and be better. And so with those kind of very broad strokes in mind, um, that's how we come to offer you this project. And so I'm so happy that you all joined us tonight. Um, a special welcome to people who are joining us for, you know, the second or third or, or fourth time. We're thrilled that you've been with us this whole time. And another kind of special welcome for anyone who's joining us for the first time. We really appreciate when there's so much going on politically, you know, that you, you took the time to spend this hour with us. So we're very happy to have you. So thank you so much for that. I want to turn it over to the panel now so that we can get into uh, the meat of the night. So um, first, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Jolene McEachern. She is the manager of Agra and Aquaculture, uh, the industry liaison for innovation at Dalhousie University. So Jolene, welcome, and I'll turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Lori. I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, thank you to the audience for joining us tonight when you um, could also be watching CNN 
and maybe have a little more entertainment happening there. But we're going to try to keep you entertained tonight. We've got an hour together, and this is such a, a passionate topic for me, and I know for a lot of you. So um, please join in and, and ask those tough questions because um, that's why we're doing this. So my day job is Dalhousie. My moonlighting job is that I'm a dairy farmer. My husband and I operate and own a dairy farm in Mastown, and we have three children. So these issues are very, very close to my heart. And this is why I took on this challenge of coordinating uh, this cluster for Dalhousie. And in no way do I expect this to be uh, an academic exercise where we are going out and telling others what we think needs to be done. This is a discussion. This has created an opportunity for people who don't normally speak about these issues together to come together to talk and to share their experience. And that's what's been the most exciting piece for me. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of, of the methodology of how we tackled this project um, in our faculty and uh, then get give you some highlights. I'm not going to do the homework for you. It's not a cold notes. You have to read the report. But I am going to, you know, skim through some of the highlights that um, I think we need to draw attention to. And then I will welcome two of my colleagues to come on and give their perspective as co-writers um, of this report. So thank you to them for joining me as well. And to those in the background at Dow who have put this together because this has been an amazing opportunity. So the first question I asked myself was, why did I take this on? And I think I took this on because it needed to be done. And uh, COVID has just brought more of these issues to light, but some of these cracks have been showing in our food system way before the pandemic. Um, food is important. It's crucial, not only as a sustenance to us, as a nourishment, but also as a comfort and a routine. And, and what I've learned through this report is just how important it is culturally and as a, a catalyst for connection in our communities. The topic when first brought to us seemed um, massive it seems like how can we drill down on something when, when food is so complex and there's so many sides to the issues. Um, but we were quickly able to focus around food security as a theme because it made sense. We were in a global pandemic. What were people worried about? They were worried about having enough food and not just the food that, again, would sustain them, but the food that they enjoyed in the ways that they enjoyed um, to fulfill cultural uh, and, and uh, religious needs. So it's more than just about having enough to eat, which is what we're going to dig a little deep into tonight. So one way that um, I thought we could approach this a little differently and, and how I thought it needed to be done a little differently was instead of going directly to uh, my colleagues and experts in the community about to ask them what they thought needed to happen, I wanted to take more of a user focused uh, methodology and go to the people in the community and really try to step back and understand what their lived experience was. Because we can all make assumptions from social media and from reading the news about what we think people's experience is. But I, I wanted to take that extra step and go out and, and make sure we really understood what those experiences were. So in, we had a really short period of time to pull this together. So in, in an attempt to take a shortcut, I drew up a list of assumptions that I had just from conversations I've had with people about the topic and sent those lists out to community members as far and wide as I could through the connections that we all had in Nova Scotia. And what I asked of those people was to tell me if we were on the right track. Are these assumptions correct? Is this what you're seeing in your communities? Is this what you're experiencing? And if not, tell us. Tell us what's actually happening. And the response was amazing. I had quite a, quite a few um, people respond and share this questionnaire with others and, and tell me who to go talk to in certain communities. Um, and it was that part alone was uh, overwhelming to me. And it was a, an extremely positive experience. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we heard, and then I'm going to get into some of the issues that were there before COVID and then briefly discuss, you know, some of the recommendations that um, some of our colleagues came up with. Um, so what I did was I took um, those that feedback and I summarized it into 11 or 12 uh, different sections in the report, if you take a look. And what did we learn? Well, what None of this is going to be a surprise to people in the community. Anybody who is part of, of a certain section of the community is going to say, well, we knew that. There's nothing new in this report. But what I hope do is maybe learn from each other. So those in the 
food producing community can maybe learn about those in the community services sector or the fisheries can learn from agriculture and vice versa. So I'm really hoping that that's what comes out of this initiative. Um, what we did learn was that consumers across the board were weary. They found COVID-19 to be stressful. They, you, you saw the lineups, you saw food fly off the shelves, you saw shortages. Um, we saw people buying freezers, try to get a freezer this summer to, to, to be able to um, buy sides of meat or whatever. Um, there was an obviousness that people were concerned about the, the ability to feed themselves in the near future and further on as the pandemic lengthened. Um, those who produce food were frustrated, farmers and fishermen, not knowing if they should plant, how much to plant, how much to fish, would they have market for their products. Um, and those who were already halfway into a growing season, I've heard stories of producers who were, you know, millions of dollars of inventory in the ground in April and not knowing whether they were going to be able to sell that. It's a very scary time for many people. Um, the labor issue, which our colleagues will talk about and made the press, you know, huge issue in, in food production, in the fishery and in a value add sector. Um, Foreign labor was the, the issue that made the headlines, but the labor issue in, in this industry has been happening for a long time. And this was just ex exasperated by the situation around uh, COVID-19. The value add sector's challenge, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, the value of institutional food has been overlooked. This was a, a, a massive learning for me about how you know, many people go to institutional food as a source of nutrition. So kids eating in, in school, at, in school programs, people going to community events, you know, even the act of going to a restaurant for those who don't know how to cook much for themselves, that became a challenge during COVID-19. So uh, some of these things, you know, are issues uh, for people being able to feed themselves. Um, the value of NGOs and the support that those community groups needed and continue to need was very apparent throughout this process. Um, food banks were called upon to step up and not only are the issues around um, the ability to have enough food, but also to reach the people that need that service. So there comes a lot of um, issues with how to connect with those folks, no public transit in certain areas, um, some pride issues, families that never had to use these services before and now not knowing how to navigate the system and not being able to just walk into a community center and ask questions. There were a lot of challenges uh, for being able to you know, help those in need where they usually had a community around them that could help them do this. And during, during lockdown, none of that was available to them. Another issue that we will talk is, is how inequality was at play. You know, many people talked about how this was a social issue and how marginalized communities suffered more and that was repeated in in the federal report that came out last week you know the marginalized communities were hit harder and had less services and those are the people that are going to need our support in going forward and the last piece that we learned about uh, was the lack of dependable data you know a lot of people said well i don't know where to start planning because i don't know what the numbers are i don't know how many people needed to go to the food bank or i don't know how many farmers we're unsure of, of what to plant. So that that lack of dependable information made it really hard for people to plan um, support systems and, and tools to help those. Um, so quickly, I'm just gonna go into, you know, these are all the issues and, and like I said, this is just a sliver and, and many people are gonna say, you're not telling me anything new, Jolene. So for those who may not be familiar with the industry, I just wanna kind of highlight some of the, the cracks that we've seen um, in the industry that are coming and being brought to the surface during COVID-19. One issue that has been very apparent is the divide between food security and food sovereignty. This is something that I think one of our colleagues is going to um, um, speak to. And for me, this means you know, it, producing the food is not the just the answer. There's a whole social and political and economic factor in here about those who have access to food. Um, so those are one of the things we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the need for innovation in the food system, uh, the processing industry, how it's anemic in this province, and we need investment in that. And then, you know, how the ecosystem can come together and um, try to come up with solutions. This, this report is only one piece. What, what happens after this report? How can all of our resources come together and 
do some about some of the challenges that we've uh, spoken about. So to me, that'll be the most exciting part is that, you know, what happens next? I really hope this is not something that dies on the vine, pardon the pun, um, but that really sparks some conversations around um, how we can more collaboratively provide solutions for such, a, such an important piece of our lives. So I'll pass it back to you, Lori, thank you. Jolene, thanks so much for that. That was great. And that's really good to get us started. I think for the conversation this evening, there's a lot of context in there. So I really, really appreciate your comments. Um, we're going to pass things over now to uh, Dr. Kathleen Kaveni. She is an associate professor in the Department of Business and Social Science uh, here at Dalhousie in the Faculty of Agriculture. So welcome, Kathleen. Great. Thank you, Laurie. And thank you for this opportunity to share ideas and challenges and some of the actions from our report. And as Jolene said, uh, we gathered a lot of information. So I'm going to take the opportunity to underscore some uh, priority actions that we recommend. In recent years, we'll recall that uh, we've had the one Nova Scotia study. And just last year, Nova Scotians participated in the largest quality of life survey. So these reports, along with what we found in our study, are really helpful data sets to help us think about and reimagine a bolder Nova Scotia. So we need together to build forward better as a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So as we know, COVID-19 has caused tremendous disruption. So I'm gonna to touch on some of the challenges and highlight particular actions around food security, sovereignty and sustainability as Joy Dolene mentioned. Food we know is central to our lives as it nourishes us, it connects us to the land and the sea and to each other. And food is a significant contributor to livelihoods across our province. My work involves food as it does everyone on this panel. So clearly food is economical, it is political, food is spiritual and sacred. It is health, it is environmental and food is social. So COVID-19 has illuminated issues of inequality where food insecurity is disproportionately experienced by women, racialized communities and those with unstable incomes as Tara Shack and McIntyre underscore. And Nova Scotia has one of the highest rates of food insecurity at 13% of households as reported by Tara Shack and Mitchell, and it's likely rising. So Food Secure Canada estimated that the number of people affected by food insecurity may double from 4.4 million, and it's currently likely up beyond 5.5 million at the moment and growing still. So beyond uh, COVID-19, the Nova Scotian health condition was suboptimal. We have high levels of non-communicable diseases arising from many determinants of health. And according to the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, diet is a significant contributor to rising rates of chronic disease. And with higher levels of cancers, diabetes, obesity, this means higher medical and emotional costs to our province. The $68 billion cost of chronic disease in Canada is not just borne by healthcare. It represents more than half of our provincial budgets as Dodge and Dion had discovered. So now add on to this, the fear of contracting a communicable disease like COVID. So we have, have dual healthcare crisis, a socioeconomic crisis along with environmental crisis and marginalized people has, has been mentioned are facing even greater adversity in these conditions. So during this pandemic, many workers have lost income, many businesses are suffering from the economic downturn, and these factors, among others, have undermined our ability to feed ourselves. Signs of inadequate uh, food production contribute to our being less knowledgeable, and we can see signs where we have local and regional food supplies undermined, insufficient infrastructure, as well as destabilized supply of human resources. So we're more alert now to the vulnerabilities. We kind of got that through this condition, but consumers don't want to have to worry about getting food or having enough. So this pandemic has prompted us to be more concerned about cooking at home. Maybe we've made changes to what we purchase and what we are doing to grow some of our own food. As Jolene mentioned, some are buying up supplies and stocking our own freezers. But fortunately, there also seems to be greater attention to reducing food waste, along with its environmental, ethical and economic impacts. So to bolster food sovereignty, the World Health Organization 
calls for urgent action to reform food systems to protect human, animal, and planetary health. Health is a human right inseparable from other human rights, like the right to safe food and water. And it's important to increase emphasis on local production. Further, we need sustainable agriculture, increased localization of food production and consumption, attention to equity and justice, and an appreciation of traditional knowledge and farming know-how, and economic and political support, as noted by Jones, Shapiro, and Wilson. So how might we in Nova Scotia make food security a greater priority? And how might food be made more abundant, more accessible, safe, suitable, nutritious, reliable, and culturally fulfilling? This pandemic has challenged us to get good at being more self-sufficient in food production and processing better right here in Nova Scotia. We have great capacity as food producers in this region. We have rich soils and we have access to ocean resources and we're leaders in aquaculture development. We have exhibited significant innovation in food processing and in marketing to a global customer base. But no one government, department, organization, community, or business can effectively address the complexity of food safety, security, sufficiency, and sustainability. So the 12 authors of this report have put forward substantial next steps. So I'm just gonna list out a few of the actions, any of which would help us advance our goals. And I'll highlight the roles that government might play, but you could insert in these places also partnerships with industry, with education and health. So the federal government could be working with all sectors to devise the best solution for Canada on a basic income plus other supports. This has been well argued over these months. And while food charity, like food banks, are critical in this pandemic as more Canadians face deprivation, Tereshak and McIntyre argue that the priority should not be on expanding food charity, but replacing the need for them. And governments can partner with producers to increase wage subsidies to incentivize Canadians who live locally to be farm workers to increase local production. And provincial governments they may offer incentives and supports and reimburse farmers for the benefits of ecological services, such as protecting habitat and pollinators, sequestering carbon and protecting water, as these will increase our capacity and our confidence in our food system. Also, in partnership with Indigenous, urban and rural communities, provincial governments could establish programs and extension services to support small-scale urban farming business development. Provincial and federal tax credits could be expanded for farmers to donate produce to local food banks. And we could incentivize more local institutional buying to thereby reduce imports and boost our local sales. Supports also could be targeted to alternative strategies like permaculture and bioenergy cropping and innovation around increasing demand for plant-based production to complement the conventional sustainable agriculture. We found in our discussions for this report that we had become too complacent about food and more promotions are needed to reignite our thinking about bolstering our own food sovereignty and security. Those of us with access to education and to the best scientific evidence could develop multi-sector regional collaboration, for example, for value addition and for strategies to increase the availability of healthy foods. Uh, programs like Cultivate and Perennia and other food business incubation services could be promoted for people of diverse ages to access training to develop their food production and processing skills. More efforts could be focused on benefiting from the wisdom of retiring farmers and developing apprenticeships and master classes to harness this local knowledge base. Campaigns could be developed to inspire citizens to support local buying from farmer hubs or the farmers markets or joining a community supported agriculture. We recommend following up on the advice of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to pay attention to rural community advocates who are calling for investing in the foundations of rural life to attract people to and increase jobs and business opportunities in support of our rural food systems. Investments also need to be made to strengthen rural broadband, community schools and healthcare, public transit and housing strategies. Local governments could provide supports to help community garden, kitchens, and farmers markets. Supporting this infrastructure has proven to be valuable investments, like in the superb partnership at the Truro Farmers Market Cooperative 
where the town supports the cost of the old fire hall building and helps to defray costs in heating and electricity by installing solar panels. So communities could get creative around ways to channel and harvest waste heat as well, using vacant lots or un unused space for urban agriculture, also are valuable additions to our food security landscape. And we can build into our community garden plans efforts like grow a row, vacant lot to active plot, and these foods can be used for school programs and other initiatives. The municipal government also could contribute by easing restrictions through bylaws that support citizens developing gardens, rearing animals, and otherwise engaging in creative approaches to sustainable food production. So these are just some of the many strategies we are proposing. I look forward to the continuing discussion here, but I'll pass it back to Lori and leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. That was great. I really love the specific examples of communities that are doing things really well. That's that's so neat to hear. And I think it's a really important part of figuring out how to move forward is the best practices mm -hmm. that some, some communities are engaging in. So I might come back to you about that in the question period just to give you an opportunity to talk more about that because that would be great. Excellent. Okay, so um, for our third panel member, we we're gonna welcome uh, Carolyn Vanden Heuvel. She is the Director of Outreach and Member Relations for the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture. So welcome, Carolyn. Thank you, Lori. Uh, so as Lori mentioned, I work for the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture, which represents over 90% of agricultural production in Nova Scotia. I'm very happy to be on the panel today and I uh, really enjoyed listening to the previous speakers. And it, it makes you think about all the different things that you might wanna say than you had already thought. And I'd also like to acknowledge Dalhousie for pulling this group together and looking at reimagining Nova Scotia. I think, you know, as we navigated the pandemic as community members and um, the agriculture industry, and personally, I felt, you know, we were constantly asking ourselves, um, we wanted to regroup, how can we re-strategize? Uh, what information would we like to have had we known this is what we were gonna be facing? So really reflecting now on, you know, if we were faced with a pandemic again or, or the challenges we see, how can we be better, better prepared in the future? So I think that bringing this group together and having the opportunity to have those discussions is really starting the conversation to ensure that our food security moving forward is stronger and we're more confident in that system. So uh, working for the Federation of Agriculture, I have the absolute pleasure of working with those that are producing food in our province. And I would say one of the best parts of my job is actually getting to know our members and getting to know the farm community and how they produce food and their different practices. So I just want to provide a little bit of insight tonight into what did we see at the primary agriculture level through through this pandemic and, and what are some of the lessons learned and just acknowledging um, what farmers went through in addition to to our communities. So Jolene mentioned a few aspects that uh, some of the challenges that were identified and she's absolutely right in the fact that um, the challenges that we faced weren't new. Um, they were challenges we've been facing for a long time and but the pandemic exacerbated those challenges and that's what made it a little bit more challenging and some of the pieces that you know we had challenges here, here and here all of a sudden we were experiencing those at the same time. And it, it definitely was a stressful situation for, for many in the farm community. So I just wanna talk about kind of the, to maybe the top four pieces that we saw rise to the top really initially in the pandemic. And, and Jolene did, did mention some of them and as did Kathleen, but uh, one of the pieces is labor. Um, we were challenged with labor prior to this pandemic. We've had a labor gap in primary agriculture in Nova Scotia for a number of years. And uh, we had programs in place to help support that labor gap. And when we saw the, you know, the borders closing and people needing to go home to care for their children and um, other people in their family, we saw those workers that we had depended on and had expected, we weren't sure whether or not they were going to be here with us again. And um, as alluded to previously, it meant that farmers were having like questioning what crops should they be putting in the ground? Were they going to be able to harvest their crops? Was there going, were we going to be able to, to put food on the shelves in our communities? And there was lots of challenging decisions that got made from a business perspective. And, but I don't think that we can also, um, that social emotional perspective that came and knowing that 
workers weren't necessarily going to be able to to make the money they needed to support their families as well. So, you know, that caring piece of uh, we weren't sure whether or not we'd have the employment to provide those workers and then how, again, were we going to uh, manage those business risks? So labor was a big factor um, and we really need to to find a way to strategize on what we can do to close that labor gap. And Kathleen had some really excellent suggestions on how we can approach that um, working within our communities and, and doing that and putting programs and training in place and incentives in place. So I think that there's definitely lots of opportunity there. We saw our markets change. Um, people weren't going to restaurants anymore. People were eating at home as suggested, and that changes um, the product that people are purchasing. So we saw that um, we were no longer selling direct to market in the same way because there weren't markets necessarily where people were going to. So we had this complete shift in how products were, were getting to our consumers and getting to to those, those communities that we needed them to get to. Um, so we saw a shift and we really need to acknowledge that, you know, the processing and farms shifting uh, very quickly to make sure that, that the products were redirected in the way that they needed to be. And we saw farm selling direct to market shifting to online platforms, farmers markets of Nova Scotia um, supporting their members and ensuring that uh, the markets were still going forward in a way that was safe and healthy to do so during the pandemic. And that's really outstanding to see how quickly uh, people were able to come together and make that shift, although very challenging at the time. I mentioned processors, you know, uh, previously mentioned processing has definitely decreased in our region um, over the years. And that's something that we really saw impact us during this pandemic. And we did see many processing lines shifting uh, what they were packaging and how they were packaging to actually meet the needs of our communities um, in this new world that we were living in. And the other piece that was also mentioned previously was understanding local. We definitely saw a shift in, in people purchasing products, but also understanding where are the products coming from. Um, we saw some shortages that existed and people worrying about uh, was there going to be food available um, in the future as those shortages on the grocery store shelves. So uh, making sure that we have that connection between our farmers, the, our food producers and the consumers was really important. And, and we did launch um, a Your Farmer, Your Nova Scotia campaign during the, the pandemic to try to make that connection with consumers. And we want to ensure that we have that trust in the food system and that trust in that primary production um, so that we know that, you know, where our food is coming from. So I would say those are some four significant challenges that, that we definitely faced as an industry. But as previously mentioned, they weren't new problems. They were just exacerbated. And then on top of, of these challenges in terms of markets and businesses, uh, we had our, our farmers and other businesses. This isn't just farm farmers that were doing this, but I'm just acknowledging um, that perspective, um, making changes to their, their systems. They were purchasing PPE. They were um, changing the infrastructure in their in their barns and their warehouses so that they could ensure the health and safety of their families and their workers and their communities. And there was really good efforts made and significant um, contributions made to make sure that, that that happened. So as I mentioned, I'm not suggesting that it's different than any other businesses, but I think it's important to understand the impact um, that, that the pandemic did have on producing food and the impact on the food system and the communities that really rely on having um, employment in rural areas. So I mentioned some of the challenges that we've seen, and of course, it's really easy to dwell on those sometimes, but this opportunity that we have to actually reflect and say, you know, what would we do differently? Um, we saw some changes in our in our primary production. We saw farmers adapt. Um, you know, people going used to selling direct to people moving to online stores almost overnight. Um, internet was a challenge. We talked about some of the pieces we need to look at to ensure um, a strong food system. And internet is a big deal whenever you're moving to an online store and our rural internet is not always conducive to that. So seeing the significant um, changes that we need to put in place to make sure that we can be successful in the future is is important. Um, 
also the, the significant efforts made in accessing labor. There were community groups that that organized to make sure that uh, there were opportunities for people to work on farm and in connecting those people. And we saw uh, processors shifting product lines, uh, consumers reconnecting with their food, asking about local, purchasing from local. So I think there's lots of opportunities there on some of the shifts that we made uh, in our communities that we need to build on. So I think, um, as I mentioned, this group really provided the opportunity to do that. Um, and as we navigated through some of the challenges, the other aspect that we saw was that um, organizations such as ourselves, the Federation, we had commodity groups, government, agribusinesses, uh, Dalhousie, everybody was coming together to try to navigate those challenges and find solutions. And, and we saw that that collaboration meant that we were able to break down some barriers that we didn't necessarily think that we'd be able to break down previously, or especially in the time frame that we were able to, to break down those barriers. So I think just recognizing that hey, we showed working together and collaboration and looking at multiple avenues is really going to make us stronger and allow us to adapt to that change. So I think taking these learnings and, and moving from them, and Kathleen had some excellent examples on, on what we need to do um, and what we could do to, to do that. And um, the reality is the panda pandemic, uh, it's not going away um, and it's not going away anytime soon. But right now we're able to breathe a little bit more, I think, and starting to understand what that new normal looks like. So now is absolutely the time for us to regroup, to re-strategize and ask ourselves, how can we be better prepared for next time? Um, how can we handle the vulnerabilities in our systems that have become so apparent over the last year? So again, this project did allow us to come together and has really given us some food for thought with some examples that uh, we can take and we can action on. And my real hope is that uh, we are going to be able to bring the food system together, gain an understanding of how we ensure that those folks uh, that are food insecure have access to the food they need. What do we need to change in our production systems to make sure that we are providing uh, a food in a manner that is accessible and affordable? And what changes do we need to see in distribution and processing? There's there's many aspects to that food system that needs to change, but I absolutely think if we can work together to develop a food strategy for Nova Scotia, by Nova Scotia, um, that will be successful. So my hope from this is that we can take the learnings from this previous year and uh, work together and develop a food strategy that we can ensure uh, that we'll be confident in our food system moving forward. So. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And I'm gonna pass it back to Jolene. Thank you, Carolyn and Kathleen. Now, those of you watching can probably understand why this was such a complex project. These issues are massive and multifaceted. Um, some, of the, some of the recommendations that you've heard just touch the surface. So. You know, this is an opportunity for us to, to chat. I wish we were in a pub somewhere where we sit down together and really brainstorm. But here we are virtually trying to do this. So please engage the best you can and ask us some difficult questions because uh, we won't know the answers. But in talking about these things, we may come up with some solutions. So, you know, I want to reimagine a Nova Scotia that can feed itself no matter what's happening in the world. So there's our challenge. Back to you, Laurie. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much to all of the panelists for this. This was so informative and it's such an important topic. And I'm so happy that we had the opportunity to get everybody together to do this. So I am gonna throw out that first question that I was talking about. I'm gonna throw it towards Kathleen with not intent to pressure, but just to give an opportunity to chat a little bit about um, that those examples, right? Is Are there examples at the jurisdiction level, at the local level, of food sovereignty and you know what can we learn from some of the communities in Nova Scotia and or elsewhere that are, are doing things really well mm -hmm. well I mean and I, of course I have great pride in in trendy trail because we have one of the finest farmers markets and it has yes, been a do. tremendous yeah. collaboration so I think one thing that all the panelists um, spoke to that I really like is that there's no blame to place everyone is part of the solution and everybody's got to come to the table. So I, I really appreciate the spirit of, of what this report speaks to, but sovereignty has shown up in um, areas where people really 
um, apply those principles that they're working together. Wolfville is another great one. There's so much happening in the little town of Wolfville. There are community proprietors, business owners who are also um, ensuring their supply is from local producers. There's a lot of collaboration in the spirit there. Um, certainly that's part of the design is we don't buy um, lesser products from a distance to save something. We, we invest in our, our colleagues and in our local neighborhoods as well. Um, a, a country like Turkey is an example of a, a national jurisdiction that used to be really um, effective in its production of food. Of course, it had a large product, um, population that was still rural, whereas we have moved largely away from rural settings. Nova Scotia, of course, has a higher percentage than other parts of Canada. So having a population base is essential. I think Carolyn spoke to that too, that we need workers. We need people willing to live in the area and lead a good quality of life. So there's many factors that contribute to regions and communities being food sovereign, um, but certainly the collaboration, the buying from each other, the building on the infrastructure. We have um, in our report recommend more infrastructure investments, but I think others could speak to that too. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I wanted to, too, too, before we get into some questions from the audience, I wanted to maybe come back to Carolyn to ask if you could speak a little bit more about the issue of the labor gap and what we might be able to do to address that going forward. Absolutely. So I will say labor specifically, uh, we, we run an egg sector program here at the Federation and that's an area where we've been reflecting on and saying, okay, well, how does that strategy need to change? Um, you know, career promotions is important, making sure people understand what careers are available in agriculture because they're dynamic. Um, it's not necessarily simply just the traditional roles that we, we think of. Um, I think we need to look at what are some of the barriers in our rural communities. We have folks in rural communities that that aren't currently working and, and why? Is it related to transportation? Is it related to hours? Um, so what types of supports do we need to put in place so that we can get folks to work? Um, you know, we also have some diversity within our farms and some are large farms and some are small farms and sometimes small farms aren't necessarily able to um, hire a full time person. So what can we do to create some groups of pot potentially employers or groups of workers so that we can address those gaps as they kind of move around? Um, but I think it really comes back to looking at, um, you know, what are the skills, making sure we have programs in place to give folks that are looking for work the skills to work in agriculture figuring out what are the challenges, what are the barriers, uh, reflecting on ourselves as an industry and saying, you know, what human resources practices do we need to put in place to ensure that we are employers of choice, to ensure that we are an appealing uh, industry to work in. So I think there's a lot of different aspects to that, but I think starting the conversation and understanding is, is why that labor gap exists and what we need to do to, to make it more appealing. Thank you so much for that. That that was such a good answer that really covered off all the different components. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Okay, I'm going to stop hogging everything and turn this over to questions from the audience. Um, so one question we're all wondering about, what are the first steps we can take to get started on these recommendations that are in your report? So Jolene, do we want to come to you first for that one? Sure, give me the hard one. <laughs> Here's all the problems. <laughs> Where do we start? Yeah. Um, so... I want to say we have, you know, two different examples in our, our colleague panel here. Kathleen gave us a plethora of places to start and some of them small and some of them big and, and um, Carolyn more focused on the plan. And so I think it's both. I think, you know, up here we have to say, is this a priority for our province? Does everybody actually care about this? And, you know, I've had conversations with multiple people on one spectrum, people saying, you know, you have me on your list, right, Farmer Jolene, like if, if stuff goes down, I'm going to have food. And then other people saying, whatever, I can get mangoes, we don't have a problem. So I think we have to come together and decide it's a priority, and then the levers start to come to play. So, you know, as, as a public admin person, Laura, you know full well, like what some of those lever, levers are in policy making and decisions. Um, and then it, it's taking this elephant and eating it one bite at a time. So it's looking at the list and saying, you know, where, how can I play a role? Who can come on my little bus and what can we tackle? And I think we've got the right people uh, working on this report. We've had the right people come together. So it's just a matter of, 
you know, somebody saying, where, where can we first start and make a dent in this big problem? That's fantastic. So Kathleen or Carolyn, does anybody want to jump in on that? Right. Well, I would say too that um, so much of what um, has been recommended is um, building on good efforts elsewhere. So um, here we have some reports that are already happening in our province. How can we leverage those and really um, strengthen? Um, I like to argue that agricultural policy is health policy. It is social policy. It is economic policy. But the question is, is it good policy? So it's that's the complexity of it. As Jolene said, like this is big and there's lots to be considered here. So how do we do this with the nuances and the sensitivities and the sacredness that we're talking about when we talk about food? There's so many human dimensions to play with. And it does, it's multi-point entry that we need to be attending to, which includes being mindful of the, um, the person's most disadvantaged or most marginalized. So uh, we have a variety of skill sets. We have a variety of interests. Let's do multiple small groups and take action and get some stuff done. Yep, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, we have lost most of our food processing facilities in this region. What steps can be taken to help our producers get raw products market uh, market ready? So I can jump in on that. <laughs> and then I'm going to look for Carol and maybe to fill in some gaps. Um, so we've had some experts speak to this in the report and as some of you may know, um, the reality of our province is that we're very small scale and a lot of our um, processing was set up in the co-op model back in the day and then as we grew economies of scale come in and um, we we get bigger and sometimes that bigger ends up being sold to other companies and then those companies decide that no we don't actually need a plant in Nova Scotia we'll, we'll build it in Atlantic Canada or even Quebec so here we are in 2020 and we have very you know anemic is the term I use because that's the term that we is with me explaining um, the, the value add processing sector in the province. So the biggest thing we need is, is investment, but no investment without a plan. So we keep going back to, you know, what exactly should we be producing um, and what makes sense to what market and then coming up with a, a plan for doing that. And, you know, the other thing I would add is we have to think maritime. This isn't just a Nova Scotia problem. Um, if you combine all of our populations and all of our farmer populations within the three provinces, we're still not as big as Quebec and Ontario. So um, I think we have to be thinking about, you know, what we can be combining efforts on. And, and the beef industry has done that with the plant and PEI. So, you know, Nova Scotia, what can we take on? What can we do that can help our neighbors um, get in this game as well? Carol, I don't know if you have something more specific to add to that, but it's not an easy one. I, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head as much as you can with that. And I think the reality is, is that invest, we need investment and we need to really understand how we make processing scalable for our region. Um, you know, what works in those larger provinces isn't necessarily going to work for us. And to Jolene's point, there are a number of commodity groups, uh, especially that have looked at developing strategies. And I think that's really important is making sure when we're looking at processing, getting the right people around the table and having the understanding of what we need to do to ensure that we can bring that capacity here in a manner that is um, sustainable for the scale of our scale of our region. Okay, thanks so much. We're going to move on to another question from the audience. How can small and micro processors be cost competitive when we have we only have a small population to support them? Yeah, so I'll jump on that one again. Um, that's where um, I think we really need to be deliberate in deciding what we should be processing and, and how we're going to sell that. Um, and I think it comes to uh, also investing in, in R&D in technology. So to Carolyn's point, um, we aren't like those larger provinces. They are micro and small businesses. So how can we work with our regulators? Because a lot of people complain about the red tape. Um, that, that is a barrier to get some of these products to market. Um, how can we work with our regulators and, and develop technologies that enable this processing to be simpler, automated, um, and but yet meet the standards 
so that we sell across provincial boundaries and you know even federal if we decide that that's what we want to do but without without us all working together you have individuals who are trying to you know duct tape things together and um it's it's not getting us in a cohesive way forward that that a, a government would want to invest in so again I, i'm all about the plan i know i keep saying that but we need to we need to discuss some of these things and to that, if I could, I'd add that um, here in Nova Scotia, we have Annapolis uh, Valley First Nation that now owns Webster Farms, you know, one of the biggest bean producers in the region and selling internationally. And we have opportunities with colleagues in PEI and New Brunswick. So just putting a plug in for the idea that Jolene was mentioning earlier, what can Nova Scotia do to step up for something? And maybe there's some value addition we could be doing. There's infrastructure supports we could be investing in collaboratively government and business doing it together. There are opportunities there that uh, we haven't tapped into in the Atlantic region yet. So that's certainly one very practical example. Fantastic. Okay, um, we are gonna move on, I think, to another question for the audience. We've got a, from the audience. We've got a couple of minutes left for a few more questions. I'm gonna wait until everybody can see it here. So. Um, how can we get more young people involved in farming and the agriculture, agricultural industry in Nova Scotia? So we picked up on that theme a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's a really, really good question. Mm -hmm. Love that question. Of course, we're in the business of education. We're, we're excited by food. You know, food is our, our lifeblood and it is, it's everything to us. Like it is and all those things I mentioned, it is sacred and it's economic, it's social environmental. When you touch food, you touch all parts of life. So there's real opportunity for people to find meaningful employment through education, you know, finding first themselves in a place where they can know that if they come to the Faculty of Agriculture, as an example, although there's many other places in Nova Scotia, there's nutrition schools, there's uh, programs at NSCC, there's many ways uh, people can learn about food. Um, but adding value is certainly um, prospects. There's exciting um, emerging businesses and plant-based. It's growing interest. Uh, there's um, drink prospects. People are certainly involved in all the microbreweries. So that involves food production and uh, drinks. So I, I think there's um, excitement to be had, but I think we certainly have to position it and help people see the quality of life is there as well. Yeah, I think that's an absolute really good point. You know, as generations changes and quality of life and our um, our values change and we shift a little bit differently on how we expect to have that um, work life balance or um, actually I had a young farmer tell me that referring it to that work life equilibrium whenever you're on farm because, you know, whenever you're on farm, it's what you do. But, um, you know, there's some big investments needed to to start farming, depending on the scale of farm. So, you know, the, there's lots of different areas you could come in, but some of those larger firms and making sure there's programs in place that support um, support our young people in coming into the industry and looking at some of those operations is important. Um, making sure that we're developing, um, you know, through education. I, of course, I'm a graduate of the AC as well. So uh, finding myself in agriculture. And I think we need to also discuss um, the dynamic component of farming. So there's lots of discussion around this in, in media, even this past summer, and people um, thinking, you know, farming is a pitchfork, but our farmers, like business people, they, they do marketing plans, um, human resources, and um, crop specialists, and understanding livestock and animal welfare. There's just so many aspects to farming and making sure that um, our young people, you know, those not growing up in agriculture like myself, really understand like all of the aspects that are involved in farming and you know it's you can get really excited about it it's 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 a really dynamic industry and it's a dynamic occupation and i think we we need to talk about that part of it a little bit more thank you so much for that um okay so there are many support services for agriculture in nova scotia what would be some for good first steps to increase the appetite for collaboration across all of these entities that's a great question <laughs> Um, go ahead, Kathleen. I'm going to well, right on here. I mean, <laughs> that we in this report, it, it kind of represents the voice of so many different um, perspectives from the sector. And um, Tracy, of course, is heading up the um, extension services within our faculty. So reaching out to community and being available to educate on the ground 
in different topics. That's certainly an example as well. But they are, um, I think these are challenging times that um, people are reluctant in some ways to um, meet in the ways we were before. But even this forum, who now we can access and more people can gather information or get um, insights that they wouldn't have been able to access before. So although it's not as social, we don't get to have our drink together like Jolene suggested, we can at least ex um, share knowledge much more readily. So I think using technology, connecting to the infrastructure across this region, not just in Nova Scotia, but across the area, um, the Maritimes, there's a lot to tap into in terms of uh, wisdom around agriculture across all the fields. Okay, um, getting down to our last couple of minutes here, I wanna throw another question at you. I've seen community groups campaigning to establish healthcare and status for migrant workers. Do you think this would help with the agricultural labor shortage? So I'll take that. Um, so we're absolutely um, reliant on a temporary foreign worker uh, program and workers coming in. And uh, from the Federation's perspective, we have been advocating for a number of years to have our workers, once they arrive here, to be part of the MSI system. That's that's definitely essential. They do, they do have healthcare programs um, coming here, but not um, specifically MSI in Nova Scotia. So we, we've we been advocating for that and there has been um, some community groups campaigning for the same thing and we would absolutely support that as a necessity for, for those workers coming to Nova Scotia. Um, and then in terms of, you know, different uh, workers coming in may have different um, desires. We do know that immigration is, it, there's interest in immigration from some of our temporary foreign workers on farm and we really need to see what opportunities there are to um, perhaps make a immigration system for agriculture that allow the, allows these workers to say they're essential to our, essential to our industry and they have a lot to contribute to the community. So um, seeing what immigration type programs could be put in place uh, for these workers, for those that do do want to stay here in Canada, I think would be would be an excellent opportunity. Fantastic. That was a great question. I think we are going to do perhaps one more question. So here we go. Uh, as mentioned, we shouldn't waste the COVID opportunity to get organized. Could any could an online community be created to assist with setting up a structure to tackle many issues? Definitely, you can join us. Help us. Yeah. Hey, come on board. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, this forum, uh, all of these networks, and I'm, there are many things underway already. So I think, um, Jolene, you could probably speak to this too, but there are definitely, the answer is yes. Come connect with us. And um, I think there are kind of brain trusts to be um, taking some of this seriously because there's so many complex issues. Let's break it down and do pieces of it together. Yeah, and I'm the how of that, I'm not sure, but I, I love the concept. Um, the other thing that COVID-19 has taught me is that I can do many powerful things in my pajamas in my living room. <laughs> so I think that that is something that we really need to consider is, you know, maybe the, the barriers before were people not being able to come out of the office, you know, they work in a day job in a certain company and they can't go out and work on their passion, which is food, because it's, it's from eight to five and they already have another job. So if we can, you know, come up with a way to make it easier to facilitate more people being a part of this conversation, like that is reimagining a new Nova Scotia, 100%. I will take I that on. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much to all the panelists for sharing uh, their knowledge, their expertise, and the work they did uh, for this panel and for this report. Um, I think it's really important some of the notes that we hit tonight in terms of the the importance of education and the importance of skills building and i think it's it's in addition to all the other themes that we talked about it's really important to think about the role that universities like dalhousie and faculties like agriculture can play in building those skills because i think it's it's a huge huge part of of the moving forward piece we have responsibilities at universities i think to be uh, as engaged and supportive in the public as possible and so i'm really glad that we're we're having this conversation tonight and the whole point of this is to be able to be a, a bit of a you know spin for new conversations to happen around this mm -hmm. so on behalf of everybody who's listening tonight thank you so much to the panelists for being so generous with your time and your expertise we do really appreciate it um 
And thank you so much for the audience for, to, for sticking with us. We are going to be back here, uh, same time, same place next week to talk about um, creating and commemorating. So I really hope everybody can join us. And um, I hope by then we figure out who the next president's going to be. And so thank you so much for joining us. And um, we will see you next week. Have a great night. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Be mighty in your jammies. Yes. <laughs> <You> take home. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.